Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am your host, and today we are talking the Friday morning question where we pose a question, we have a guest on, and we talk about said question. And today's question is, what started the road to ban conversion therapy in Canada? And we could not have asked for a better guest to answer said question because he is kind of the catalyst that started the ban on conversion therapy in Canada. And that is Devin Hargreaves of Lethbridge. Devin, thank you so much for doing this. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I know we've corresponded a bit in the past and things didn't work out. As I'm happy to be here finally. Which, uh, if anyone knows, if you follow us on social media, we have Devin's button somewhere around right there if you're watching this on YouTube. If not, go over to YouTube and you can know where I'm pointing. Um, Devin, I want to ask the open-ended question to get this ball rolling here. Petition 1833, uh, the Canadian uh, House of Commons Petition 1833, uh, the sort of the catalyst to ban conversion therapy, why did you start it in 2018? Yeah, it actually started a, a bit before that. Uh, I was chair of Lethbridge Pride Fest. Uh, so we were out, uh, I believe it was 2017, uh, at uh, Tabor Pride, representing Lethbridge Pride and uh, raising the flag there. They do a phenomenal job of putting on a, a great festival, a, a very dedicated and uh, a board that is uh, helping Pride be seen in smaller uh, areas in southern Alberta. Uh, so a uh, local activist, uh, now one of my best friends, but I didn't know them that well at the time, Jen Takahashi, uh, was working to see what could be done to ban conversion therapy in Alberta. Uh, so that was kind of where that conversation started. We quickly partnered up. Uh, two is better than one. And uh, we started campaigning to have conversion therapy banned at the provincial level. Uh, so there's quite a few rules and regulations regarding petitions at all levels of government. Uh, we had to adjust. We had a lot of meetings. Uh, we even were in communication with the premier's office. Uh, partway through that, uh, though, uh, and as you start to educate yourself, uh, you realize. So we've got municipal bans. Uh, I believe Vancouver was the first to, to ban conversion therapy municipally. Uh, provincially, uh, conversion therapy has been banned uh, by Ontario and uh, a few other provinces. So a municipal ban bans it through business licensing uh, specifically, and a provincial ban bans it through health. That leaves a lot of loopholes where the practice can still continue if it's not being provided as a, either a health practice uh, or a for-profit business. Uh, so we kind of had to sit down and say, how do we ban it across Canada and cut out those loopholes? Uh, it sounded very ambitious when we first said it, uh, and I said, let's go for the criminal code. Uh, so, so why you? Why? And I guess that's the crux of the whole issue, because yes, you're someone from Southern Alberta. It is a very traditionally conservative area. Um, this could have been picked up by many people. I'm not sure if you had conversations with other people across Canada about this issue or across Alberta uh, when you were looking at the more provincial side of it. But why was this important to you? I've advocated for many years for the LGBTQ2 plus community. Uh, I'm a, a big believer. I've kind of my motto in life is if you see something that needs to be done, step up and do it yourself. Uh, you're not going to get anywhere by waiting. Uh, for someone else to take initiative and to, to step up. Uh, and uh, so it was a, an issue. It's affected uh, statistically thousands of uh, the queer Canadian population. It's uh, affected many more in the United States and across the world, really. Uh, so we saw the need and uh, we just stepped up and started working to, to get a band. Uh, as chair of Pride previously, uh, you, of course, come in communication with many members from all walks of life uh, who identify as part of the, the queer community. And uh, the stories that we heard were heartbreaking. So many people have been subjected to it in some form or other, uh, be that talk therapy to uh, much more uh, aggressive uh, ways of providing conversion therapy. Uh, acquaintance in BC uh, was subjected to uh, drugs to, to try to change their orientation. And it's a heartbreaking story. And uh, 
one of the big issues that we found when we started uh, trying to, to ban conversion therapy at, uh, at the provincial level, many people did not realize that it still happened in Canada uh, and uh, assumed that even if it might happen, there's no way that it could be legal, uh, which at the time uh, it, it was legal. There were no protections in place uh, to, to prevent that. You you just openly talked about the stories that you heard, um, a, particularly with an acquaintance in BC. BC is more of a, and I don't want to say a liberal uh, province, but it's more, it's less conservative than this province of Alberta. Uh, you were the chair of Lethbridge Pride, and I'm not trying to bash Alberta because I, I do not want to come across that way. For anyone listening, this is not that. It is it is well known that Alberta is more of a conservative province. We were governed by the progressive conservatives for 44 years. We elect a lot of federal MPs who are in the conservative party outside of uh, the major cities, Edmonton and Calgary. I, I want to know the Alberta angle on this, because when you started the process of hearing stories, were you shocked at how many stories you were hearing from people or in our own backyard? Because you would assume, and I hate to assume anything, that people want to talk about this stuff, but they don't also want to talk about this stuff because it is hard, heart-wrenching to talk openly about the fact that your family has sent you to cure your gay. And I'm using that word uh, not as a bad thing, but as a, this is what some people have to go through is you are gay and we don't want to be gay anymore. Was it hard for you as someone who is a supporter, an ally, to hear these stories about people in our own backyard? It was heartbreaking. Uh, that's part of the reason, too, that we stepped up to, to ban it. Uh, not a, a lot of people were talking about it. Uh, and every time that you do bring it up, there's always, or when we did bring it up, a lot of criticism, a lot of flack that you get. And to have survivors be forced to relive that trauma was just something that we didn't uh, want to, to subject them to. Uh, and so being someone who hasn't been through conversion therapy, uh, to be an ally and to, to step up and, and move forward. Uh, as momentum built, uh, a lot uh, more people started to come up and share their stories through the, the media. And uh, I think that was a, a vital part of getting it banned, was people willing to to share that trauma and to, to share what happened to them. Uh, when we started out, uh, of course, several people had talked about it. Uh, Pete, and I apologize if I mispronounce his last name, Pete uh, Gagedy out of uh, BC, uh, actually wrote a book, The Inheritance of Shame. He was instrumental to uh, getting it banned in Vancouver uh, and sharing his story and uh, moving forward with that uh, city ban uh, helped to inform our process and to affect what uh, we did. And uh, throughout that process, we were in constant communication with him. Uh, groups of survivors started to band together and share their stories, uh, even internally. And to, to be uh, privy to that was very sad, uh, but it uh, helped keep that focus on, on what we started out to do. And uh, all in all, the process uh, started in 2017 for me. Uh, and it ended in 2022. Uh, so to maintain that momentum, uh, it, it was good to stay focused on, on the end goal. You, you, you started by talking about trying to lobby the provincial government to ban it provincially first. So I want to stay there first before we do move into the e-petition and the Canadian government's response to that e-petition. I, I my my background. Anyone who knows the show knows who my husband is. So he was the very first uh, openly gay cabinet minister here in the province of Alberta, elected uh, Ricardo Miranda. So I, I got to ask the question because having allies in government at that time in 2017 when you're trying to do this was it easier than you expected or was there pushback and I've not had this conversation with my husband so this is going to be completely sort of new to me and learn a little bit about how they dealt with this issue because this has come up and I want to have the conversation that I can sort of hold him account right afterwards and say why did you not do this better so from <laughs> your perspective Devin 
How was it dealing with the provincial government and trying to lobby them to ban this conversion therapy that was still an active practice here in the province of Alberta? Uh, well, I'll say I was not aware of that. Uh, that was your, <laughs> your, your husband. So congratulations. I do remember seeing when he posted that he got married. Uh, and uh, representation matters uh, at mm. uh, all levels of government, at all levels of being in the public eye. So that's incredible. Um, we started out working with our local MLA uh, that didn't go as far as I would have liked. Uh, we did start uh, working then directly with, uh, uh, off the top, I believe, Sarah Hoffman's office, as well as uh, Rachel Notley's office. Uh, they were uh, quite uh, good to work with as far as getting it banned, uh, but we did end up having legislation ready to go uh, that uh, the Friday before it was supposed to go live on the Monday, they gave me a call and let me know that they would not be proceeding with that. Uh, and they opened a focus group to study the practice and put it off to, to ban after the next uh, election. Uh, so I, I do want to say there was a, a lot of great uh, MLAs to work with on that. Uh, our local MLA, uh, Shannon Phillips, was uh, incredible, helped bring a lot of visibility even when we moved up to the federal level, sharing our petition and, and such. Uh, but I, I do feel that it, it was kind of used as a, a political uh, pawn. And I'm sad that it worked out that way. We understand that uh, trying to affect change of this size um, is never a, a fast process. I just wish that we were able to work together across Alberta to get that ban in place uh, here uh, before we move federal. Now, you talked openly in the, at the beginning about how uh, municipally it's about the business practice of it. Provincially, it's about the health practice of it. But there's still that loophole. There's still that loophole where, well, technically, we're just having a discussion. We're not doing it for profit. So therefore, we can still have the conversation to convert you. But it is not a for-profit organization. We're not doing it for health reasons. We're just doing it as a kind gesture, using their words, not mine. Um, so you have to sort of look bigger. And this is where you have to go federally. So after seeing the focus group that the um, provincial government has introduced, you decide to start an e-petition, I'm assuming, right? Or how does that e-petition work out? Because mm -hmm. I've never done an e-petition so, and I know how bad government can be of trying to get things through them and try to even start a petition. So for you, did you know the process beforehand or was it sort of learn as you go? Learn as you go. Uh, it, uh... <laughs> like I said, there's many rules regarding petitions. This is actually something I want to see introduced in Alberta, where the federal government does allow for um, petitions to be done online uh, under strict uh, rules and regulations. You have to do the petition. You have to have a member of parliament sponsor it. And uh, then you have to get at least 500 signatures to uh, have that even presented in the House of Commons. Uh, and Provincially, you have to do hard copy signatures. Uh, and I, I think it's now 2022. Uh, we do need a, a way to uh, push voter engagement. Uh, we always talk about we need more people to get out and vote. We want more people to be involved with politics and to discuss policy, to have their say. Uh, but at the provincial level, it's quite limited, uh, especially during COVID. I think we've seen that there's better ways of doing things. Moving online uh, has definitely helped. You and I are recording this in two different cities right now. Uh, so I would like to see a, a provincial means to, to petition uh, introduced. Uh, I think that would, would go a long way. But as far as the, the federal process, it was a lot of trial and error. Uh, it was going onto the House of Commons website and reading it and rereading it. Uh, and uh, then at uh, that point, we called MP Randy Bostonalt's office out of Edmonton. He was the LGBT uh, plus advisor to the prime minister at the time and uh, got a little bit of feedback there. And uh, then we proceeded to, to move forward with launching the petition. Uh, and at so, the time, you go ahead. Right. I was going to say, uh, so your petition opens on September 18th, 2020, 20, September 20th, I apologize, 2018. I've just, I have all the dates beside me. So if you're seeing me look at the side, it's <laughs> because I'm reading the proper dates. So it opens for signatures on September 20th, 2018 at 
and they have the exact date. That's the God bless the government for being so transparent in that way. At 9 16 a.m., so seven o'clock a.m. here in Alberta, it opens. Now, you just said that you need 500 signatures. Did you expect to get it? Because this was, as you openly said at the beginning, it's a practice that people thought was already banned. People, it wasn't happening here in Canada. So it wasn't making the news. And sometimes the news may not look at e-petitions and they might not go, well, it's an important issue we need to cover, so we'll cover it. It's more of a, oh, it's an e-petition. We'll see what happens afterwards. What was your thoughts when that petition finally launched? Yeah, I'll back up a couple of days. Um, so we had the petition. We got someone to sponsor it. It was actually uh, Sherry Benson out of Saskatchewan uh, that uh, put her name behind that to, to sponsor the petition. And uh, then we waited. And then we waited some more. And we had no idea when this petition was going to go live. Uh, so we weren't able to try to put together a media event, anything like that. You had the, the time down. I have the date written <laughs> down over here, but I didn't put the time down. Uh, so it was just wait, wait, wait. And then came through that it went live. Uh, so then it's push it out on social media uh, and uh, cross your fingers. We actually had uh, 500 signatures within the first 24 hours. Oh, wow. uh, and so it's okay. We're making progress. We're moving ahead. This will be on the, the floor of the House of Commons. Uh, and then from there, it was launching more of an educational campaign. We had to put together a frequently asked questions document. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15-second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. I, I, I want to talk about Sherry Benson for a second. Sherry Benson is the former NDP. So for those who might think, oh, Saskatchewan's conservative, how'd you get a conservative? She was a NDP MP for Saskatoon West. So that's who uh, Devin was talking about there. How did you connect with uh, Sherry? Was it just one-on-one? -on -one? You picked up a phone and called or... Like, and I, I just need to know that process because I think that's the process where I'm, I'm confused. How does an MP attach their name to an e-petition like this? Or is it just, hey, click of a button and it's attached? You can submit the request through the petition without talking to them. Uh, mm -hmm. I would highly discourage anyone from doing that. Uh, you probably want to connect and kind of have that conversation. Uh, we initially uh, approached Randy Bossenault. Uh, and just scheduling and what have you that uh, it didn't work out. Uh, and uh, his office actually suggested uh, Benson's office. So I believe they had already been in communication with them. Uh, we reached out and said, hey, can we collaborate on this? Uh, it's even an MP sponsoring a petition is not necessarily them endorsing it. It's just allowing that uh, to be heard in the, the House of Commons. So she was great to work with, put her name on it, and uh, we were able to proceed with the petition. 18,200 Canadians from coast to coast to coast put their name on an e-petition, e-petition 1833, that you started. Now, I was looking at the numbers because I'm kind of a numbers man, and I like looking at the numbers. I was pleasantly surprised that the second most signatures came from the province of Alberta. Ontario was first, and then according to the government website, uh, which is petitions.rcommons.ca, which anyone can look at any e-petition that's currently going on, Alberta came in second. Were you shocked at that? Because I thought maybe with Ontario and Quebec being the top two, uh, with the most uh, people in the provinces, they would be the top two, but Alberta came in second. I'm not. And one person I do want to highlight, uh, again, Jen Takahashi amazing to work with. We did everything together on this. Uh, I drafted the petition and she proofread it and we were able to, to move forward with, uh, with that. Uh, having been involved in the uh, queer community in Lethbridge for years and that expanding out to the, the surrounding regions, uh, both my connections as well as Jen's connections were largely in Alberta. Uh, so I think kind of that personal relationship aspect of it and our contact sharing it and uh, uh, really helped to, to get those numbers from Alberta up. 
it took a little bit longer to, to start uh, seeing traction uh, out east, kind of beyond our own, at the time, personal networks. And uh, it, yeah, it, it kind of built and, and grew from there. Uh, our local media here in Lethbridge was fantastic at uh, picking it up and uh, publishing it here, uh, which uh, I think you might have referenced. Uh, you, you don't really know. It's not really a story that a, a petition's launched. Uh, but once it started taking off, uh, I did an appearance on Power and Politics. Uh, we did multiple interviews uh, on numerous uh, networks uh, across Canada and uh, some even international. Uh, nearing the end uh, of that petition, we were on the biggest uh, English language show in Montreal, I believe, uh, and uh, that helped to expand it out there. Uh, we've had people, uh, Jen lined someone up to do a interview in French for us, uh, because at this time I do not speak French, and to, to kind of break into to that market was uh, phenomenal as well. You. So your petition launches, your petition has a lot, is, is gaining signatures. The government will still need to respond to this. And this is the part where you have a liberal government in office in 2018 or 2019 when the petition closes. You have Randy Bossano, the LGBT uh, advisor to the prime minister. You have Seamus O'Regan. You have Scott Bryson in uh, office as well. Uh, one of the most, uh, I would say, LGBTQ2 plus friendly governments ever probably in office in Canadian history. They respond that we will look into this and we will have a potential discussion on this issue. I'm not sure what the exa exact response is, and I want to get your res uh, response to that. What did the government say when the petition was actually tabled in the House of Commons in 2019? Uh, it essentially uh, condemned the practice of conversion therapy, which was great to hear, uh, but it did put a little more um, focus on the provinces enacting it. Uh, and so that was disappointing. Uh, but like I said, this entire endeavor has been a lot of uh, hurry up and wait. Uh, so once that ended, uh, I, I did really feel that uh, just the petition alone and the amount of media and uh, education that we were able to do around that uh, brought it up. Uh, I ran provincially in 2019. And so I'd kind of already decided which way I was voting, uh, but I still went through Vote Compass. Uh, it's something I've always done uh, every election since I've been very young. Uh, and uh, conversion therapy was on the vote compass uh, provincially. Uh, and just that we were able to raise that much visibility and that much education, that it would have that type of effect uh, really blew me away. So we continued to work with it. Um, and we ended up having legislation introduced in the Senate, uh, which was great to see. Uh, you can get legislation introduced either from the House of Commons and go to the Senate for a uh, second uh, sober thought yeah. uh, is how it's defined. Uh, but the Senate can also draft their own legislation and move that and then send it to the House of Commons. Uh, so that was incredible. Uh, we've had many interruptions over this process. Uh, Bill C-4, which is the actual uh, legislation that bans conversion therapy in Canada is actually the fifth piece of legislation that we saw uh, throughout this. I, I didn't know that. I thought that was the very first one. What do you mean by the fifth? So the Senate would, I'm assuming, would be the first one, or would would that be the fourth? Like I just, I, I, I didn't realize that there was that many pieces of legislation introduced and nothing happened to it. Because let's be honest, this government sort of drop the ball in 2020 when this could or 2021 or 2020 when the last 2021 when it was in the senate and then it had to be dropped off the radar because an election was called and all government business stops so what do you mean by the other four there uh, i personally i'll just add that i think that uh, we had opposition parties really stalling uh we could have got it passed faster uh but we had bill s260 i did write these down. I'm reading off notes here. Uh, Bill S-260 was introduced April 2019 uh, in the Senate. Uh, we had, uh, of course, the 2019 election. Uh, so that slowed that process. We then moved on to Bill S-202, uh, which was, uh, I think it was identical to the, the first one, but it was the second piece of legislation. Uh, then 
March 2020, we had Bill C-8, which was introduced. That one was quite short-lived uh, when Parliament was prorogued. Uh, and then Bill C-6 came back in October 2020. Uh, that was killed, of course, by the uh, election. 2021 election. Uh, and I, I do want to note on that, uh, Bill C-6 was good. Uh, I did like it. It was progress. Uh, we were getting somewhere with that. So we had uh, support from, of course, the Liberals were the one, uh, the Liberals are the party that moved it, uh, the NDP, uh, and uh, even the Bloc Québécois and the Green Party. Uh, and Conservatives, uh, as you're, you're probably aware, over half that party, uh, including the Member of Parliament for Lethbridge, voted against uh, that legislation. Uh, so between Bill C-6 and Bill C-4, uh, which is what we ended on, uh, there was a bit more work done on the bills. It went from banning conversion therapy strictly to minors and uh, a focus on advertising to banning it for all ages, which was a phenomenal uh, change. And uh, I'm glad that the legislation we ended up with is the, the strongest one that was introduced at any point. You make, you make mention of some of the conservative MPs who, I, I let's say filibustered the uh, passing of that law. Uh, I don't want to paint a broad stroke here because some were in favor of that passing and some were not. So let's talk about the ones who were not, including the Lethbridge MP, as you just forementioned. When they were making comments on the House of Commons floor, what was going through your head? Because you heard things like, this is going to stop people being able to have a conversation with kids. This will stop uh, a kid from going to talk to their priest and not being able to get help. What, were, what was going through your head? Because this is kind of a, a massive, and I, I'm using this word, uh, this analogy in, uh, a little bit oddly here, but this is your baby. This is, you started this, you are the one who introduced the e-petition with help from a lot of other people in Lethbridge area. But you were hearing people sort of say, what the practice is, is not what people think it is. But in reality, it is. It is a horrendous practice where people are trying to tell you who you are is wrong, and they will do whatever they can to convert you into being a straight person. What was your thought going through your head? It was disappointing to see. Uh, one thing that I said right when we launched this uh, petition and throughout this movement is that this is not an LGBTQ2 plus issue. It's a human rights issue. Uh, gay marriage is, well, well, we'll go back further. Uh, being uh, gay uh, was uh, listed as a mental health disorder. Uh, from there, it was persecuted. Uh, I've seen the, the Fruit Fly uh, project uh, where people were being fired uh, from the federal government if they were identifying as, as queer. Uh, so we've seen a lot of change. Times change, people change, and uh, gay marriage was legal. Uh, that was the, the first, or one of the first big ones. But in 2018, when this started, how was conversion therapy still legal? Uh, we, we really view ourselves as a very progressive country, uh, and we are, uh, but there's still, still those aspects that uh, people don't think about, which allows these practices to continue, so. You, you, you've talked about how sometimes there's a slow pace in government, about how things can seem like it's taking forever. I wanna talk about Bill C-6. The government introduces Bill C-6, or sorry, I just want to make sure, Bill C-4? C-4 is the one that C4. passed. C-4, sorry. So in November, end of November, the government, after the election, they come back. One of their very first motion, uh, bills that they introduce is Bill C-4. There is still some on the opposition benches in the Conservative Party who were against the previous bill, who got reelected. Some weren't, but some were. I think everyone in Canada who watches politics on a regular basis was shocked that the Conservative Party's government house leader, if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong here, and you might be able to correct me on that, calls for a, a 
clean vote to say, hey, all parties are in unanimous support of this bill. Were you shocked? I was. Uh, yes, I was shocked, uh, but it made sense. Okay. Uh, I've been involved in politics for quite some time. I, as some of your listeners may be aware, I ran provincially in 2019. I ran federal for the, the Liberal Party of Canada in 2021. Uh, there was so much backlash uh, over half of the Conservative caucus voting against banning conversion therapy. So with that unanimous motion, uh, what it did is it prevented a recorded vote. So there's no indication of which members of parliament were present in the house, uh, which were present via uh, electronic communications. Uh, so if they, they disagreed, it, it did allow for the legislation to pass. Uh, again, nonpartisan, the liberals, the NDP, the Bloc Quebecois, uh, the, the Greens uh, all supported it. There was no way that legislation was not going to pass. We just finished an election. They can't stall it through to, till the next one. Uh, so rather than allow it to be a free vote, just by allowing it to, to go unanimously, it uh, saved a, a lot of embarrassment. That happened on December 1st of December 2021. Six days later in the Senate, I think this is the fastest I've ever seen government ever move in my life. They pass it. The Senate passes it and it gets royal assent on December 8th, 2021 doesn't take effect until 30 days later, but I want to talk about December 8th first. When it gets royal assent, you, I, I remember seeing some of the social media stuff that you were posting that day. You were happy that something that had been so relegated to not being aware in the Canadian mindset is now officially banned. It's done. It can't happen after it's a uh, 30 day passing. What's going through your head? What do we have to do next? <laughs> that's okay. why I'm involved in politics. And that's why I've ran. Uh, I've, I've spent years advocating and uh, moving things forward. When I moved to Lethbridge in 2011, uh, I immediately ended up on the Students Association for our college. And it was a, a fight to keep mental health funding for supports in post-secondary. Uh, we went to, to war against uh, Premier Redford's cuts. Uh, there's always something to do. Uh, and rather than always advocating uh, to an elected individual, I think it makes a lot more sense to be elected and to, to have that say at the table. Uh, so that's that's what I thought. It's four, four to five years worth of, of advocacy uh, kind of came to an end. Uh, it's nice to, to kind of put that to rest now, and it's on to what are we going to, to advocate for next. At the beginning of the interview, we talked about the stories you heard, the heartbreak of people who have gone through the conversion therapy process, as much as I don't want to call it a process, but the conversion therapy hell that they went through. When this officially became the law of the land in 2022, January 7th, 2022. Did you reach out to these people and thank them? Did you reach out to the people who told their stories and said, thank you for being able to tell your story because we want to be able to make changes as big as we've done in the last five years? Many oh. conversations were had uh, after the um, legislation passed the House of Commons. Uh, I was actually in a, a meeting. Uh, I knew we were up for second reading. Uh, I was going to, to check it out after. I, I didn't think we were going to have second reading move into third. Uh, and then my phone started blowing up. Uh, a dear uh, friend in Ontario uh, called me uh, shortly after that happened. And uh, we had a, a laugh and then we cried. And uh, uh, again, many relationships were formed, uh, and uh, this there's no way that this would have happened without all the survivors who have uh, stepped up and uh, shared their stories. And uh, like I said, it's horrific that people have to relive that trauma. Uh, and so to be able to, to share that story and put a face to, to what actually happened uh, is a, a huge eye-opener for people. 
CSA, I've definitely thanked uh, not even our survivors, but uh, fellow advocates that uh, stepped up and, and pushed this in their respective provinces or helped bring awareness of organizations that were perpetuating the practice. And uh, it's been a process. Many people involved, uh, I will reiterate, uh, largely uh, nonpartisan uh, from, from start to finish. Uh, I will add on that note, though, uh, having ran Liberal in this last election, uh, I was at work and my phone rang uh, a few weeks later, and uh, it was our Right Honourable Prime Minister. Uh, so we had a, a great chat, uh, and I asked for reassurance that this legislation would be moving forward. I didn't want it to wait to the, the build up for another election. It's uh, vital legislation that, uh, again, should have been banned years ago, but it wasn't being talked about. And uh, he ensured, uh, assured me that it was top priority for his government. And I, I think uh, he followed through on that. Uh, there was several pieces of legislation that they wanted passed before the government went on break. Uh, and uh, to see that in that list uh, really brought us joy and uh, to see it move that fast. Uh, was unexpected, uh, but appreciated. The e-petition, e-petition 1833 uh, conversion therapy petition that you started in 20, I, I want to say 2018 because that's when it launched, but let's say 2017 Absolutely. when you officially uh, started. And Bill C4 that was just passed, that is now the law of the land. Are you happy with the, the, the bill and the law as it stands, or could it have gone further? Uh, as I said, the, the difference between the Bill C-6 and Bill C-4 was mm -hmm. really... But I'm talking uh, about between your petition and Bill C-4. <laughs> uh, it's, it's on my social media, actually. Uh, I put up a comparison of the e-petition 1833 and the preamble uh, for uh, Bill C-4. And it's almost identical. Uh, one thing that uh, was raised to me uh, by someone around Lethbridge was transporting minors out of the country. Uh, and so the inspiration for that really came from uh, child prostitution laws. Canada will prosecute you if they find out you leave Canada uh, to engage in that. Uh, and uh, rights for our children in Canada are protected. And I wanted that same level of care uh, put in, in this legislation. So I'm very happy with uh, how it came together and uh, what was actually passed. There are a few people in this world who or in this country, I would even say, that can say they've made an impact on Canadian lives without even being elected. While you've been an inspiring politician, uh, you're a regular person just like you and, and like myself. You have left a mark on Canadian history. When we look back and we look back on that 20, 2003 same-sex marriage vote, we all remember the exact moment where we were. When we look back and we remember the Bill C-4, the conversion therapy ban bill, we know exactly where we are. From your perspective, how does it feel to know that you, even if nothing else happens in your life, which I guarantee it will not happen because it seems like you, you have your next plan already uh, processing, looking back and saying, I've made a difference on Canada, how does that feel? feels incredible. Uh, I, it really was a, a group effort. So many people, so many survivors, so many uh, advocacy groups, so many unions uh, uh, and uh, organizations, companies. Um, we had one major company send out an email blast to promote the petition, um, Lush specifically. Uh, and uh, that was unexpected. Uh, and uh, I, I think it just goes to show how many incredible people there are in Canada. Uh, and I think it goes to show that uh, as a, a dedicated and uh, committed uh, electorate, we do have the, the tools to affect change at a, a national level. I, I don't know how to properly word this question. So if I, if I fumble through it, I apologize. Knowing that there were, there were businesses and there were organizations in this country that had were set up to do conversion therapy, now that they are illegal, do you, does it kind of bring you joy knowing that people are now a little bit safer because of what you've done? Absolutely. Uh, I think the reality of it is uh, this legislation provides the grounds for um, prosecution and to enforce 
the ban on conversion therapy. Uh, I am well aware that the practice is not going to fully stop. Uh, I, and I think that uh, each and every one of us needs to be on the lookout for uh, these, these practices trying to continue uh, and to rename and uh, find different methods and branding to, to continue these practices. Um, but uh, again, I think it allows for them to be held to account. My last question for you, Devin, before we do our wrap up is this, um, what, what would you want people to know about what you've gone through in the last five years that we haven't talked about in the last 45 minutes of the show? Because you have accomplished a lot, but I feel like we've just scratched the surface. So what else would you want pe Canadians in particular, or for the, for my listeners, strangely in Australia or Germany or Britain or England, or even for some reason, Haiti, hello, Haiti, what would you want people to know? Just that uh, we can all affect change. If you see something that uh, you think needs to be changed, step up and, uh, be that uh, that catalyst for change. Uh, I, I think it's less about what I as an individual did. It's more about what was accomplished uh, by everyone involved. And uh, the fact is there's so much that we see and turn a blind eye to just because somebody else will deal with it. Uh, so my my challenge to myself every day and to your, your listeners would be let's see something that needs to be changed and let's uh, step up and get it done. I want to thank you so much for everything you've done over the last five years of your life. I know uh, five years seems like a long time, but in politics, it can seem like forever because sometimes it doesn't move as fast as you want it to, uh, especially when you're dealing with not even the, just the federal government, but you're talking about the provincial government as well. So I, I thank you. I think we, we took a we took a quick detour in there and got it banned municipally in Lethbridge too. <laughs> oh, there, there you go. And municipally. <laughs> there you go. So I, I thank you because I, I feel like we don't tell these stories enough about ooh, it's always okay, it's great that it's uh, banned, but it didn't just, the government just didn't wake up one day in 2019 or 2018 when they introduced, uh, 2020 when they introduced the first law. This has been going on for a while. This The movement towards banning this has been going on for some time now. And like you said, it we, we pride ourselves on being a progressive country, but sometimes if you look at the dark history of our country, it doesn't seem that way. So thank you. And I thank you and your organization and everyone involved who worked with you during this last five years to ban this because it's horrendous and I would not wish it upon anyone. So now that it is officially banned here in Canada, we are better off because of people like you. So thank you, Devin. Absolutely. And thanks for having me on. A uh, little bit of a longer interview on it than I'm used to doing. Uh, I took a quick peek at your website before we got on and it said aiming for more than your 15 second soundbite. And uh, so thanks for giving the platform to have these in-depth discussions. And uh, I look forward to talking with you in the future. For sure. Um, uh, my last, I guess my, and I guess my technically last question is how can people follow you? How can people learn a little bit more about you? And just, if they want to reach out and say, thank you, and just sort of give that sort of same thing I just said, thank you for doing what you've done for the last five years. How can they do that? Absolutely. Devin Hargreaves at, uh, on Twitter, uh, Devin Hargreaves on Facebook uh, and, uh, on Instagram. So pretty straightforward <laughs> if you can get the last name spelled. <laughs> which anyone who knows the show you know what i'm about to say if you want to follow devin or send him a message the links are in the show notes follow him on facebook twitter and instagram highly recommend it if you're in the lethbridge area you know him quite well if you're in alberta you know him if you're in all across canada or even around the world follow him i highly recommend it uh for everyone here at the cross-border interview pond no wow i was about to say my old name of my old show but it's not cross-border <laughs> it's cross-border interviews with chris brown uh have yourself an excellent rest of your uh, Friday. See you back here on Monday for another great episode. Devin, thank you once again. Absolutely.